gives me great pleasure to uh, have the wonderful Jason Rivello here. Thank you. So what we'll do is I'll kind of interview Jason, as it were, and then at the end we'll do a, a bit of a and a So if you have any questions, we'll um, I'll get to you at the end. And then we'll have a break, refreshments, drinks, and then we'll have a wonderful solo concert from, from Jason. So thanks for coming. Thanks for having if me. If you can talk into the mic just for yep. our, our live audience and yep. our live streamers. Um, so I know now you live in Bath, but mm. um, you're from southwest London, is that right? Were you born in Wandsworth or somewhere? Yeah, Southfields. I was brought up. Southfields. <clears throat> yeah, not far from Julian Joseph. Oh, OK. Mm. That's something I was going to ask you about. Mm. Um, so what's your kind of earliest musical experiences, <laughs> thinking back to your, to your childhood? Um, well, the, when you said that, the first thing that popped into my mind was this... Um, I was at, when I was at primary school, and I used to play guitar a bit, and we had a, we had a concert. I must have been about six or seven, and we had a, a you know a school concert, and I went on stage with my guitar to play the piece, and I sat there, and my mind just went completely blank, <laughs> and I couldn't remember anything, and it was such a disaster. I had to just stop. So how old were you at the time? I think I was about six or seven, but I just remember I had to sort of give up and just, <laughs> you know, walk off. But I, I remember the sort of disappointment of that. Right. But it sort of, I guess, I guess with anything you do, you know, the, the disappointment is the thing that can either make you go, oh, maybe this isn't for me, or go, right, <laughs> I'm going to get in the hang of this, you know. So th I, I guess that's, that's what I did. Wow. So that. the guitar was your first instrument? Well, I mean, you know, when, uh, n not especially. He just played a bit of, you know, a bit of sort of chimes and <laughs> guitar and recorder, and, you know. So you, did you have quite good music in your school? Was everybody kind of... In um, no, it was, just a, it was just a sort of normal, yeah, you know, normal school where you have, you know, the, those chime bars and right, yeah. <laughs> percussion instruments. So everybody was kind of encouraged to do something. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. So when did you get into playing the piano then? So, Well, we, we always had at home, we had a piano that my, um, I guess my great-grandmother sort of passed down. So it was one of those brown pianos with candlesticks on. And, <laughs> and it was a bit out of tune as well. Um, and so that was always there. So I always used to just sit there and and make up things on it, which I think, I mean, in a way, I think, you know, for kids, improvising is the most natural thing that they would do at an instrument. They wouldn't naturally go, oh, can I have some music to read <laughs> for this? You know, so that sort of exploration, I think, is quite um, innate in us. Mm. So how did you go from tinkering on the communal house piano to starting lessons and and starting a career? Um, well, my f I had a teacher for about a year and then he um, he went away. But he, he was called Julian and um, I always, the thing I remember about him was that he he could play match of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, to, you know, to, I, I must have been about five and I just, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get my head around the fact that he, he was playing something that was on TV. You know, it was just blew my mind. Um, and and he, 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 yeah, he, he taught me. Um, actually, can I, shall I play a little yeah, thing? He taught yeah. me this. And that, that also blew my mind because <laughs> I, I just remember thinking, wow, the notes, they all fit together and they, you know, oh, they nice. sort of, yeah, they're going in an opposite direction, but they always sound <laughs> together, you know. Um, so I had lessons for about a year and then, th then the lessons stopped for a few years. And then when I, I think when I was about eight or nine, um, I had a, and, you know, in those days it was really all classical. There wasn't, you couldn't really learn anything else really <coughs> in terms of sort of music lessons so I had classical lessons from about nine I suppose eight or nine 
Great. And uh, did you come from a musical family at all? Did your parents or...? Yeah, so my, they both played a little bit. I mean, they weren't professional or anything, but my mum played a bit, you know, she played... Du, 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 <laughs> on the piano. <laughs> and, and my dad played classical guitar. I mean, not he was OK on it, although he didn't... I, I sort of always remember over, the, you know, I'd, you, you'd hear him play the same piece for 20 years and it, sort of with the same mistakes. <laughs> but it was always, a, you know, there was always, um, that was quite sort of, um, what's the word, sort of idiosyncratic of our house, hearing some of those classical pieces sort of wafting through that he played. I remember the first time I met you, um, it was in Jersey, and I I just got started getting into jazz, and for some reason our little local band ended up doing a support gig for you. And I remember we kind of murdered Spain. <laughs> and, uh, and I was so embarrassed. I think the whole of our band were kind of embarrassed. And I remember you were standing at the bar. So this was about 95 or 94. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you said, oh, my brother plays Spain. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the only compliment you could pay, you could pay us. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's OK. So does your brother still play? Does he, is he into music? Um, uh, he he was quite good. He played, he sort of played piano, you know, till he was about 15 and then I think girls and oh, <laughs> other things, things took over. Took over yeah. So he gave up. But he was quite musical. Yeah, he doesn't really play now. Though. So how did it, how did you decide that, you know, you really wanted to get into music and take it, you know, take it mm. seriously? Was there a particular person you met or introduced to a certain, you know, jazz and stuff like that? Well, I think there was... Um, in my mind, there were two moments, I'd say, that were... I mean, you know, you, you, I suppose every, everything all contributes to it, doesn't it? But there was one... I remember one moment, I think it was the 1982 World Cup, and there was... A, there was I, I was quite into playing football, you know, as most... I suppose I was 13 then. Um, and there was this match with um, Brazil and Italy. I think it was a semi-final, and I think it was 3-2 to Brazil. But it was, it was such an amazing match. But I remember watching it and sort of thinking to myself, hmm, I don't think I'm as good as, uh, you know, at football. I'm not good enough at football to do, the, to do football. Right. What else could I do? Um, oh, yeah, music. <laughs> so that was one that sort of just stood out in my mind that moment. But then I think probably the next moment, and I suspect, you know, that like most people that play music well probably most people that do anything actually but you know in music sometimes you have an experience of either listening to something or playing in something where you just have this amazing sense of wow that you, there's this sort of feeling that you're sort of in the music somehow and i i think that those experiences is what drives us to keep doing it, <laughs> sort of hoping that will happen again. <laughs> but I had one of those experiences watching, um, it was Herbie Hancock, and he, did, he was doing with the rocket band at Hammersmith Odeon, oh, yeah. which is Hammersmith Apollo now. Yeah. And I think that must have been like 1984 or something like that. And he just did, there's, there's a tune called Chameleon that he does, and it's got this amazing Rhodes piano solo in the middle. And he did that, and I remember just hearing that. It was sort of like heroin <laughs> for my ears. <laughs> Not that I know what heroin is. <laughs> but um, I remember listening to that and just, again, it sort of blew my mind. And I thought, that whatever, whatever's going on over there, I want to be part yeah. of that, yeah. yeah. And I just sort of remember, I, th I sort of floated out of the concert <laughs> and I, for, for about an hour. I was just, I couldn't think properly, and, you know. But I think that that's probably the, the moment. Yeah, I think that's when you go, OK, that's so what I want to did do. Did you then go and try and find loads of Herbie Hancock records or? Yeah. Because this, I guess, is the day before, days before YouTube or anything like that. You just had to really search exactly. for the stuff. Exactly. Yeah, you had to go to um, our price and find <laughs> the three ninety nine one because <laughs> you had to save up all all month. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I did. I did. So I've still got all the records that I got oh, from fantastic. there. But I've got yeah, I got Headhunters and Sunlight and um, yeah. And did you did you start then listening to them and trying to work out what he was doing? Yeah. 
yeah so I didn't no, no one had actually told me to do that but I did yeah I was naturally I had so I had a, a jazz funk band my first band with my friend from school Patrick Clark Fantastic. So we had a, a jazz funk band called Savoir Fair. <laughs> <laughs> and so we used to do, you know, I, well, I'd sort of discovered Herbie Hancock and Bob James and Grover Washington and so we, the Crusaders. So we used to do their tunes and I used to sit down and, you know, uh, work out the solos and see what they were doing and, and so, so that we could play them in our... So we oh. could, you know, play them in the band, which was like, an, you know, in those days, there was, wasn't really, the facilities were quite basic. So we sort of, you know, it was just like in the school hall. And we just had a little, there was this Wem bass amplifier that used to go, and you had to sort of bang the top, <laughs> and then it would <laughs> stop. Um, and just an old, you know, sort of an old grand piano and a drum kit and a sax. Great. And yeah. So were you encouraged by the teachers at all to no. do this? Right. Not really. They used thing. to walk. Sometimes they used to walk in the hall like that, going. <laughs> 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 but th there was a couple of teachers that really did support us. But I don't think, I don't think people really understood what we were doing, and it was sort of quite unusual for fourteen or fifteen-year-old kids to be into jazz. You know. Yeah. So, what was your first kind of public performances then? How did you did you try to get some gigs with your little band and? With Savoir Fair? Yeah. Yeah, we played at the PTA evening. <laughs> <laughs> and I always remember because I, I ended up drinking too much sherry, which was disgusting, and I was really sick afterwards, you know. Sorry, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. That's lesson one, isn't it? Lesson 101, how to play when you've had a few drinks. Yeah, I've never drunk sherry since. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what were your first kind of public performances apart from the PTA how did it go from yeah that playing does public? seem quite well I'm thinking um we did we had a few I think we did, we played at this um that used to have these sort of soul weekend uh, events and I think I remember playing at one in Gravesend with Savoir Fair I think yeah um but I actually I think my the, the Oh, I know, we used to play it in the Rock Garden, you know. And, oh, no, that's actually, so I'm getting a bit, that was a bit later on. And I remember, oh, yes, with Savoir Fair, the, the main, the most exciting gig. And I think in some ways, some of those early gigs are kind of the most exciting because you you're sort of just starting out on this thing and you just think, wow, this is amazing. Um, we won the Streatham Youth Club talent competition. <laughs> I think it was 1984 again. Um, and that was just, you know, amazing. And we bought a little amp for the group. And so we just sort of did, would do things like that. But I, 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 I think I played, my first sort of more sort of bigger gig was play, I think I played Ronnie Scott's when I was 16, I think, 15 or 16. So how did yeah. you get from the PTA to Ronnie Scott's? Yeah, I know, it seems, <laughs> I must have missed out some steps. <laughs> well, you, you know, we used to do, um, you know, pub gigs in pubs. There was a pub called The Cricketers, I think, in Putney we used to play. Just anything, a anywhere that would have us, basically. But then you gradually, um, you start to get, no, you know, so someone hears you at gig, oh, if you heard that young, you know, whippersnapper and, yeah. and then word gets around and and then the Ronnie Scott's gig I played, it was a band led by a bass player called Howard Brits. Right. And we supported McCoy Tyner. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I shouldn't really have even been in the club because I was too young. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So you must have been, were you, were you like a, you know, an eight hours a day practice. Uh, you're obviously you're kind of renowned for being, you know, having a great technique, and and I think you've done some cl kind of classical performances mm. and things. So, did you, when did you decide? You know, I might be actually quite good at music, and that might be something I want to do. I think, yeah, I think it, you know those moments. I said before that really sort of, I think, I've, yeah, that, that sort of um, inspired me. But I did used to practice quite a lot, and I did practice quite a lot on my classical stuff. Um, I think I think that the thing I, with the jazz stuff is I kind of, for some reason, I just, I sort of got it 
quite quickly. I sort of understood it, what it was. So I sort of, I think I made quite a lot of progress with the jazz stuff in quite a short space of time, you know. Um, I don't know why particularly, but it just seemed natural to just me. Like the logic of how it all works. Yeah, 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 just, you know, and I did used to listen to recordings like Oscar Peterson and Herbie Hancock and and just, you know, copy what they were doing. And, yeah, it, it did seem, it seemed sort of like home. It seemed quite natural right, yeah. to me. So further education, um, did you come to a point where you thought, what am I going to do when I leave school? Am I going to go, you know, obviously you said you had this calling for music. Mm. Was there any pressure to do something other than music? Like, were, you, were your family into the idea of you being a musician? Well, I, I yeah, I'd sort of buy... In those, you know, in those days, you could you only had to go to school till you were sixteen, and then you know the next two years were sort of optional. And and um, I think you know by the time I was f probably fourteen, I knew I wanted to do music, so it was it was sort of a no brainer really. But but I did go to sixth form college in Clapham, and I was doing um, I was doing maths computing and music and but at the same time I was like I was doing gigs by then you know like uh, Ronnie Scott's doing a gig and then turning up for my <laughs> maths lecture in the morning <laughs> which was kind of <laughs> a bit weird <laughs> and after a term I was a bit naughty but after a term I was just sort of sitting in this I remember this statistics lesson and they just used to have these sort of tables of it was like naught point naught 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 Three, two, one, and then naught point naught 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 one seven three. You know, and it's just like about fifty of these numbers, and I just remember looking at it and just having that sort of thought, like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a musician. So I I went into I sort of I was quite impetuous, and I went into the um, the head of year and said, um, I'm leaving and went home and my parents because I sort of knew if I discussed it with my parents they'd say just stay you know stick with it stay um so I came home and they weren't too pleased <laughs> <laughs> and I said do you know that college I, I was at <laughs> what <laughs> um and I was playing a lot then and so they sort of said to me okay well because you could leave school then. So they said, because um, I said, I just want to practice and be a musician. They said, OK, well, if you want to do that, then you have to pay rent if you're going to stay at home. So I was like, oh, but if I have to pay rent, I'll have to get a job and then I won't be able to practice. Um, mm. But then I used to go to this jam session at this place called Ziggy's in Great Portland Street. I'm just, no one's gone to sleep yet. <laughs> um, and there was this piano player called Lionel Grigson that used to run it, and he used to teach at the Guildhall. And um, I met people like Gerard Presents, a great trumpet player, and Steve Williamson used to play there, and Philip Bent, and Julian Joseph used to play there. And, um, and this, the Lionel Grigson quite liked me because he you know I'd learned some Oscar stuff and a bit of Bill Evans and he you know he was really surprised to see someone so young um so he at the Guildhall he managed to get me to be able to go a year early to the Guildhall but without having done the A levels which you would normally do so I got a sort of fast track in and I did a th they sort of when I went, they sort of put together this new course, which was like a mixture of classical and jazz. So I did classical piano, actually, first study, and then jazz piano, second study. Like, you know, sometimes people would play clarinet or something for their second study. So I did jazz piano. And um, so that, that was sort of the first time they'd done that. There was a trumpet player called Paul Edmonds that did that with me. And we did a three-year course, and I was... I just thought, well, actually, this is a great opportunity. Part of me was sort of thinking, but I, that means being at school again. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to be out gigging. But then I thought, actually, this could be really good. I was a little bit not sure about doing classical again. Um, 
but I but when I got in there, I had a great teacher called Norman Beedy, who I really just classical teacher who I was I thought was amazing and it really inspired me and actually sort of things that he's he taught me still are in my playing now and then I studied the jazz as well and actually it turned out to be a really good three years you know it was I was I felt quite lucky to you know to have had that opportunity and then I started sort of doing gigs and things still while I was there and it was yeah it was a good time and 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 also loads of practice because the guild was quite especially that like there's it's got these basement rooms at the bottom that are really dark and there's nothing there's no windows or anything so you sort of go all you can do is go in there and practice there's no distractions so I guess you had did you get a grant did people have grants back yeah in those they days? had grants so yeah. you didn't have to worry about paying your bills no, and no, stuff like no, that no no yeah. did you network did it did it did it yeah. open up a lot of doors of meeting lots of players at the Guild Hall? Absolutely. So, I mean, well, for instance, I've just um, I've, I've just done an album with Tim Garland, who I, I met at the Guild Hall. So, we, you know, we jammed in one of the rooms and both went, wow. <laughs> and we've been friends ever since, really. But we've just made a new album that's literally just been printed and um, called Life to Life, a little plug. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's an example. I met I, there, there's a great saxophone player called Jean Tucson jazz from messengers. America, from the yeah. Jazz Messengers. Yeah, and he, I met him at Guildhall because he was over doing some teaching, and we really hit it off, and we've been great friends since then. And all sorts of people, Steve Williamson and Philip Bent, and yeah. Great. So, did you start writing your own music at this time? Did you start to compose? Did you? What sort of things? Yeah, so I was, I was, you know, sort of writing my own tunes probably since I was fourteen or fifteen. You know, with Savoir Faire, we st <laughs> I wrote some classics. <laughs> yeah. Is there any evidence of Savoir Faire? Is it out there? Anyway? I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know how our first album did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. There's probably a cassette somewhere, or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's any. Uh, <laughs> there's any effort. We did when we won the Streatham Youth competition. We did Taxi, you know, the, and, oh, the Bob and James, the, you know, the yeah. Bob James tune. Yeah. But I always remember the drummer went, "Yeah, this next one we're going to do is that tune off the telly." <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. That was his announcement. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, yeah. So obviously. You've, you've kind of when you leave the guild hall, I guess what you're a year early, so mm. what's that, 19, 20? Yeah, 20, like I suppose I would have been. Yeah, what was your next step in, in doing music as a full time thing? Well, I think about a year before I left the guild hall, I mean, this is so, it was so different in those days, but I got um, like jazz, at that time, jazz was going through a sort of mini sort of boom. Um, and it was quite popular and, you know, there's lots of jazz clubs and jazz dancers and it was quite, there was even, you know, things on TV, jazz things on TV, which, I mean, you hardly see anything nowadays, but, so I, and I, you know, I was sort of the, one of the young sort of rising stars sort of thing. And I got a, a, a BMG Records offered me a record deal, which I sort of said, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> um, because I didn't have enough material and I, you know, I wasn't quite sure what I'd do. So I spent about six months. I said, just, and also I, you know, cause I was still at college. I said, look, just, can you just, it seems crazy <laughs> in today's climate, you know, you'd bite someone's hand off if they offered you a record deal. But yeah, I, I suppose I was, there, there was some maturity <laughs> there. And I, and I said, can you give me six months so that I can write some tunes and which I did. And then, so basically, I sort of came out of of music college and straight recorded an album Fantastic. pretty much straight away. So who did you uh, get to do to play on on your first album? So the so the, the they had quite good budgets those days for recording, and the records 
the company said, well, who do you want to produce it? So I just sort of thought, well, aim high and we can always work <laughs> down <laughs> rather than the other way. So I said, could I have Wayne Shorter to produce it? Who's my hero? <laughs> sort of thinking that, you know, that would never happen. And then it did. <laughs> and so he produced the first, that, that album. So did he have to come over? Did you go over He came there? over. Right. He came over. And um, there was Jeremy Stacey was on drums, Lawrence Cottle on bass, a bass player called Julian Crampton, um, Carl Vandenbosch on percussion, Dave O'Higgins on saxophone. I think that was it. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. And, um, and, then, uh, and, and after that, then Wayne Shorter invited me to go and tour with his band, you know, and I sort of remember the, th I remember the phone call kind of going, yeah, 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 yep, yep, I can do that, that's fine. <laughs> so, and then, hey, and then sort of putting the phone down, go, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> running around the room. <laughs> that must have been yeah. an experience. It was amazing. I mean, it was, um, so I did si a six week tour with them. We did, some we recorded a TV program in Los Angeles with his band, and I met Herbie Hancock. Oh, and fantastic. he, you know, he because he was playing with his trio, and he came over and sort of. I, in fact, I, I was playing a piece that I'm probably going to play tonight, which I've sort of played since. Those, that it was by Errol Garner, and he came over and ah, you like Errol Garner then? <laughs> Yes, Herbie. <laughs> <laughs> and you. <laughs> Fantastic. So, I mean, where do you go from there then? Oh, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, and it's and it's funny. Um, that, that sort of experience in some ways had not a negative effect, but I think there was something about having so much success. Because to me, that was like, you know, he was my absolute hero. And to end up actually playing with him... Um, yeah, it was. It sort of had. A, I mean, I don't want to get too <laughs> <laughs> negative, but it's had a, there was something in me that sort of it made me slightly question, like, well, if this is sort of as you've as achieved, high, yeah, it, well, yeah, yeah. It, in a way, and and there there was a sort of a feeling that is there more to there must be more to life than this sort of thing, which that's a sort of another story. But I got sure. into sort of spirituality a bit and yeah so you sort of question those you kind of did the buddhist thing and yeah yeah but sort of i think it started there with the you know um yeah because sometimes when your dreams come true you sort of they're no longer your dreams <laughs> and you there's a part of you that's like oh <laughs> it's a bit like um just sort of jumping ahead a bit but i, I always remember when playing with Sting, and you'd sort of see the stage, and you'd see all the lights, and the, and, and you know if you're in the audience, you'd just be looking at the stage and going, "God, that's amazing! I wonder what's behind there. It looks like a magic world, you know." But you'd go behind the stage, and there's like sort of five hairy musicians talking about, "Have you done your laundry?" <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I found a fluff and fold down the corner there, and, <laughs> and then ceilings with those sort of polystyrene <laughs> tiles, you know. So it's sort of yeah. So you, I, I know you try to do a bit of ret retreat, but you still do retreats now, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I still meditate and all That's that great. Sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so did you take some time out then from from playing? From I did. So I took I took about a year. I did want I wanted to go and be a monk, but at that at that time I didn't. I think I was too immature, and I did a couple of months and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that I wasn't, I didn't quite know what to do next. So I had a sort of bit of a sort of wilderness patch. Um, but then I decided to get married and have a family. And um, and then I got an email from, that's when I got an email from Sting saying, do you fancy coming? And uh, he's got a house, he's got a few houses, but he's got quite a, an, a well, very nice one in in Italy. Um, in Tuscany, and he said, "Do you want to come and <coughs> and um, do some recording for the band?" And I went up there, and we sort of got on really well. And so then I ended up the next five years. I was it was playing with him. That sounds quite difficult because, on the one hand, you're starting your family, mm. and then 
Obviously, that's a kind of an all-in type gig, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that must have been very difficult to... It, it was quite hard, but what, on, on, the, on the good side of it, it was that it, for that level of touring, excuse me, <coughs> often you'll be... Um, well, one, it's quite well paid. And two, y y we did lots of touring like in America where you'd go to Chicago maybe and you'd be based there for two weeks and then you'd each day you'd fly, you know, so you'd sort of maybe have a sort of 400 mile circle and you'd fly to the gig, to a gig and come and then fly back to Chicago. So that meant that y it was possible to bring families right. over. So we managed to you know the, I, my, my, it was my youngest son George he managed to come over with Justine quite a, quite a few times so we did manage to um, <coughs> you know have quite a lot of family time then did you find doing the sting stuff challenging at all I mean I don't I mean it probably had loads of challenges with the touring mm. and learning material and all that kind of stuff and but was it challenging you musically at all? Did you feel that you were lacking something? I think in some... I mean, it's it's sort of challenging, not in the... It's not challenging in the same way as playing jazz or difficult jazz tunes or anything like that. But it's sort of challenging in a different way in that you're... You have to find things that work nicely in a song and you have to support singers. Sometimes jazz musicians play too many notes <laughs> and can get in the way of a, of a good song. Good song, yeah. Yeah, so the, he used to, we used to call it the death stare from Sting because <laughs> he'd be at the front of the stage so you couldn't actually see his face. But if you if you were, if you got a bit carried away and did too much, you just, what you'd sort of just see is this. You'd see <laughs> like that. So if you got that, we called it the day. If you got that, then you know you've you've got to rein things in a bit because <laughs> he's got a no something you've done has distracted him. You know. But he always had really great kind of jazz musicians in mm, his band. Mm. I remember the DVD that that was filmed in Tuscany. Yeah. And Christian McBride and Vinnie mm. Colliu. Was it Vinnie on that? I think. No, it was Manu Katchi. Manu Katchi. Yeah. You know, so all great musicians as well. So the sound checks must have been been fun. Did you ever like kind of? stretch out in the sound checks yeah sometimes we did you know um but st yeah he w he was really um he was constantly sort of sculpting the music so he, he, we we always had a sound check and there was always a fair bit of rehearsing and he'd go right. you know with there'd be a new you know he'd say oh what you know in whatever it you know whatever song it was why don't you try well let's try something here and so it was it was always sort of slightly evolving and then you just had to remember the change there were no parts there was no sort of you Nothing know sheet down, music yeah. yeah so you just had to if, you know if he said just hold that thing for four beats on this bar you just had to remember that in the in the concert was he always kind of ch always kind of tinkering with it yeah yeah he did he liked you know some things would stay the same for a bit and then he'd yeah he sort of seemed to enjoy i always think there's something um you know, like if you're writing music, there's always, there's a nice approach where you don't, it's not necessarily you just sort of write the whole thing and it's done, but you might sort of write a bit and go, yeah, I like that. And then sort of go, hmm, wonder what I could, and maybe I'll put that bit there and then you might leave it and come back to it. So there's, there can be a lot of just trying things out. And he was, that was very much his style. Yeah. So you then did that for six years, did you? Did you say yeah, six so years? Yeah, I did that for about, yeah, but maybe five, maybe five years. And then you moved on to, was it Jeff Beck? Jeff you? Beck, and I did that for about six years. And that's yeah. a completely different type of yeah, sound. Yeah. A kind of rock thing, really. It was, yeah, but it was um, sort of rocky, but uh, but actually quite, you know, quite, quite you know, there's quite a few difficult Things, tunes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, so it was quite sort of challenging, more in a sort of muso y way, not in a bad way, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, and. I mean, he was just, he just a he's just a really sort of inventive guitarist. He's always looking for different ways he can play the guitar. You know, he'd get different sounds out of it. He'd sort of play in different places on the fretboard. And, yeah. Um, and his, I always really liked his taste in music. So he'd like... It was so extreme. He'd like something by Lady Gaga and then Gaga. 
and then he'd like he loved Ravel's Pavan and you know he'd like Indian music all sorts of things but I remember you know he'd say oh have you heard this but it was the Bulgarian radio choir you know so really sort of but I, I always thought that the things he liked were actually really good he sort right. of sniffed out the the sort of quality stuff so how did you end up working with him did he headhunt you or were you recommended I think it was because he'd we'd done a sort of double bill I'm sort of saying double bill it might have been that he was supporting Sting <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> no, let's say it was a double bill and I think that's when we met he said you know he sort of met the whole band and um I think what happened originally, because with Sting there was two keyboard players, so there was another keyboard player called Kipper. That was that was his nickname. It wasn't his. <laughs> he wasn't christened Kipper. But um, and we became really good friends on on the tour. And I think originally Jeff wanted him to do it, but he was really a guitarist. Although he played keyboards with Sting, his first instrument was guitar, and he wasn't. He couldn't really play sort of yeah, fancy yeah. stuff so he said why don't you try jason and then we we got because I, I was actually jan hammer was one of my fa you know one yeah, of my yeah, yeah. sort of favorite yeah. piano players and jeff worked quite a lot with jan hammer and he you know he really I think we, I me and jeff those, both yeah. shared a mutual yeah. sort of love and respect for jan hammer yeah i think i've got an old vinyl of the two of them playing somewhere yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a live recording, I think, and uh, and Wired. That's an album he did. Wired, where they they're both on. Great. So, again, very two very long kind of standing kind of you know stints really. So, uh, what made you decide to you know stop the Jeff Beck or was it your decision to then try something else? Yeah, or? I think it was <coughs> it was m mainly because the kids were. <coughs> I think George was ten when I stopped and I just had that feeling with the touring gradually because you're spending a lot of time I mean it's a it's a nice lifestyle because you're sort of in you're traveling in in nice hotels and things but it can when you're sort of especially if you have a family and you're away so much you sort of feel a bit like well, why am I in this hotel room miles away you know watching telly when my family's <laughs> you know doing loads of stuff and you sort of I, I I kind of got to the point where I just thought I don't want to miss out on my kids growing up anymore and um you know and I sort of I think I missed playing jazz as well and you know just just a few things it just felt like it was time for a change so I left the, the touring world and came back to being a jazz musician which was quite hard yeah. <laughs> it was a bit of a shock financially <laughs> 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 so there's some hairy hairy years <laughs> but um but you did a, a, a lovely album didn't you of when you were looking after your kids that's right yeah the kids the jazz which I've, not, I've not heard any I, I know about this album but i've actually heard it. have you got any copies of this oh i, I don't you know I, I i had a bit of car problems on the way here and i ended up forgetting <laughs> my cds but i did i did a but well yeah because i because i had kids and you know you sort of end up watching all these things like thomas the tank engine you know and as a musician you're sort of you know you're trying to get the most out of watching thomas the tank engine so one of the things i i would do is i'd hear the music and sort of work you know kind of work out what the chords were and you know so i had this sort of you know this kind of set of tunes that i'd learnt from the tv and then a friend of mine who's a great drummer called stephen keogh um he just said Come, you know do you want to do a trio album and I had all these tunes and I just thought, well, what? yeah, let's do these tunes. So I sat down and sort of did these quite sort of sophisticated arrangements of, you know, like Thunderbirds <laughs> and <laughs> Scooby-Doo. And it really amused me, <laughs> the thought of doing these tunes in a... Um, and actually a friend of mine, who's a bass player, actually he's actually, uh, he's he called Mike Janish, Michael Janish, and he um, he played in the trio once, but he's American, and he didn't know any of the, the <laughs> tunes, and he just thought they were just normal, like, standards, <laughs> <laughs> like Thunderbirds and... <laughs> That's a great Thomas story. the Tank Engine, yeah. 
That's a great story. I'm just going to check if there's any questions online. How are we doing time-wise? Um, I did have a funny story. Just, it just, yeah, it just reminded yeah. me of... Um, because when we did the kids' album, we used to go into primary schools and do concerts for them. And we used to have this bit, because one of the tunes was Spider-Man. And so we had this sort of section in the show where I'd make my phone ring and then, you know, pick it up and go, yes, oh, OK, all right, and then sort of go, sorry, everyone, I've got to go and move my car. Um, I'll be back in a minute. And then the drummer and bass player would play a bit or you know do something with the kids and then i'd come back in dressed up as spider-man <laughs> my spider-man costume <laughs> and we'd do spider-man you know and then i then i'd go out and come back and then i'd go oh i'm, I'm back the co you know did i miss anything and then the kids would go spider-man <laughs> no he didn't and then i remember one kid sort of said You've got the same wedding ring as Spider Man. <laughs> it's like, shut up, shut up. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's fantastic. And your kids play as well, don't they? Are they musicians? Yeah, so my, my son George, the older son's a drummer, although he's gone into, um, he, he ended up going into doing aerospace engineering oh, wow. in the end. He was a very good drummer, and I think, you know, he still plays, but he's working in a computer company. But I remember sort of saying joke my my sort of joke to him was you know how can you be doing a you know why can't why are you doing a job in science can't you get a proper job in the arts <laughs> <laughs> what am i supposed to tell my friends you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then my youngest son jack is a he's into sort of um you know production and hip hop and soul music and trap music and no, he's not into that anymore he's but he he writes oh, and right. he's 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 studying at bim which is like a, it's a, like a pop music school. In, there's one in Fulham. Great. So he's still he's studying there, and he's he's you know he writes great tunes and sings and plays guitar and and um, when he was still at home, he used to be we we shared the computer for writing stuff and. I'd I'd go on the computer and see one of his songs open, and then go oh I'll just do him a little solo, on <laughs> and I'd do him a solo, and then I'd come back and I'd just see it dil rubbed off. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so that takes us to kind of what you're doing today, really. Um, obviously, some fantastic albums that you've just done recently. One was with the is it the Plain Chant? Yes, yeah. How, how did Which, that come about? So that was um, one of... The, so the music teacher at our kids' school called Ro Roland Robertson, um, and he was... The, uh, we just got on really well. He was... A, he, he, he played a bit of jazz, but he was m really mainly a classical musician, but he was just really... He's just a great musician, you know, so we... we we, we, we hit it off. And he just said, well, he, he had a group of um, plain chant singers. So it's like five men and just singing the, you know, the Latin, the Gregorian chant, you know, in churches and things like that. And he said, why don't you come and, could, you know, could you play piano with us and see what happens? So we did a concert in Wells Cathedral. And basically, you know, I sort of... Um, I play piano with it, and we do. I sort of arrange some of the plain chants. What, what's quite good at the, with the plain chants because they're they're just single note things, and they're always in what in, in music we call the modes. You know, so it's like one scale. So they're all usually in one scale, which means because they're quite set, it means the harmony you do it gives you quite a lot of room to do funny chords with it <laughs> basically <laughs> but it really um so it's sort of i improvise with them and some of it is is worked out and but it just creates this it, it's sort of yeah it's just a really nice sound it's sort of quite unusual and it sort of has it's got this thing of it's like music that's you know maybe a thousand over a thousand years old sometimes but then mixed with improvised music that's literally never been played so it's got this um sort of old and new thing going on but it, i don't sort of just play like bebop jazz over it yeah. it's sort of it's sort of in the style of it keeps the spirit of the plain chant 
but it just yeah i think it really has a an interesting effect and i i say i call it it's my latin album with monk tunes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's very good <laughs> So they've all got different names on the album. They've all. Did you? Is that? Are they just? What well, the singers? No. They, <laughs> <laughs> all the all the pieces on. They've all yeah, got different so it's names. it's it's, a, it's actually a mass. It's it's the oh, candle okay. mass. Right. And then I wrote. A, I actually wrote. So the, the, we have one tune that we do that's actually where they do harmony. So it's a piece I wrote, and I wrote the words in Latin. So I sort of wrote a kind of poem and then translated the words into Latin on Google Translate. <laughs> and I thought, no one, no one will know who's going to be going, hang on, that grammar's not very good. <laughs> but then um, Roland, his, there was a, te a lat the Latin teacher at school, he showed it to him and the Latin teacher went, no. <laughs> so he sort of rewrote, very kindly rewrote the Latin for me. Um, and so then, then it, because it was in Latin, then it just fitted with the other, other the other tunes. Yeah. Any plans to do any more concerts with with that project? Yeah, we've got a couple of things next year. Um, we've got one in Cambridge, I think. In I think it's in March. Um, and one in Wales in January because we do the candle mass, and it's lovely. And we do it in Wales Cathedral, and there's. There's sort of some seats at the edge, but you can just walk round, and the singers also walk round the cathedral, so you can just walk round and hear the music from... I, obviously, I'm on piano, and I can't, <laughs> I can't, like, reel the piano round. But, but it's just... Uh, it's like hear, 3D, hearing the like a 3D well, hearing thing, that, yeah. Sorry? Like a 3D thing, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and hearing, this, you know, hearing the plane chant in the place where it was intended to be heard it, it has a real sort of you know it sort of you feel the history of it it's quite haunting right hmm. and we're coming up to that time of year and there's another kind of project that you've done with ian bellamy rather like your um kids songs doing yeah the christmas the, the christmas, christmas so every year which we've done must be like eight years now maybe or seven or eight years and we just record we record some christmas tunes um and it's just a bit of a funny story because we've done things like, you know, jing we've done everything you can think of, jingle bells and, oh, now my mind's gone blank, but little, little what donkey. is it, little donkey, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I remember one year I suggested, I can't remember what it was, it was one, you know, a Christmas song and to Ian and he'd brought, you know, little donkey and last Christmas and, <laughs> you know, all I want for Christmas is you. And I brought this tune and he went, uh, what, you really want to do that? It's, it's a bit cheesy, isn't it? <laughs> I thought, Ian, <laughs> the cheesy boat sailed years ago. <laughs> Fantastic. Has anybody any questions at all? Somebody's got a message. But... Since, yeah. Since finishing touring, making life as a What's your range of things you do? Education and gigging? And yeah, it's, it's a bit of everything, really. So I do... So it's gigging. I, I do, one of the things I got into is writing TV music a bit. So, I, you know, like library music. So, you, you know, when you're... I don't know, watching Gardener's World. <laughs> is, that, is that on? I think that or is Country a, File yeah. or something like that. You know, you'll hear... You might hear one of my tunes on there, you know, um, and 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 I do teaching and sort of workshops and things in colleges, that sort of thing, and then performing. Um, I've done. I, I I work with a great singer called Claire Teal, and I did some of the orchestrations for big band, and she did a classical, uh, not a classic, a jazz album with an orchestra, and I did some orchestrations for that. So yeah, so it's sort of quite varied. Yeah, which which I like, you know, I, I quite like the fact that there's different challenges. Yeah. Nobody else. Um, as you're only half, we're halfway for your story. What's what's to come? Anything on the bucket list? Anything that you haven't done yet that you think, oh, that's something I might want to do in the future? What do you mean, like half? Like I'm going to be a hundred? Yeah. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> well, I'm planning on being a hundred. <laughs> Great. I like that. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I sort of feel like. Um, 
Yeah, I don't really have a, a bucket list of you know. I feel I, I, it's it's it feels like I've had so many great things. It would kind of be greedy <laughs> to want more. So I feel like you know I've been very fortunate to have had and worked with the people I have. So it's more now. It's just for the fun of doing it, you know, which is I think good good reason. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, oh. Just one, um, mm. Mm. I think my, like, <clears throat> Beethoven is one of my favourite composers, and I still play, mess around with some of the sonatas that I learned, because um, I feel like his, he's just got that sort of, to me, he's got that, he's like, that balance between really catchy, pop-like melodies. I think they're like pop tunes, but yet with this amazing sense of sort of development and, and especially like the piano sonatas are so, they're sort of so rich, so many different textures and he's, the way he uses the piano is, yeah, it's just really full and interesting and you can sing along, you know, he's got so many bangers. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then the other composer, no, I mean, obviously lots of composers, but one other composer I love is Ravel. And I, I, mem I remember playing, it's a, it's a piece called um, Gaspard de la Nuit by Ravel, and I played the first one called Ondine. <coughs> and I just remember it's got about, you know, it must be like eight or nine sharps, loads of, like, way too many sharps. So it makes it really hard to read. So I, I remember when I learned it, I just wrote chord symbols over each bar because actually the harmony in Ravel is the same as jazz harmony. There really isn't any difference, you know. So I think Ravel's one of the composers like Prokofiev and many other composers around that time span that jazz musicians have nicked bits from. And, and actually, I think vice versa as well. I think there's some kind of backwards and forwards between the, the jazz musicians that were around at the time, you know. But there's, you know, the harmony is so similar. Um, yeah. I think there's a funny story of Rebel and, and Gershwin, isn't there? And they oh, met. They met. Yeah. And um, I think Gershwin wanted to go to Rebel for some lessons. And, uh, and then Rebel asked Gershwin how much he earned, and he said, oh, you know... 70 million and Ravel said I think I need to come for you <laughs> <laughs> so that's that yeah let's wrap it up there I think yeah. Jason Rebello. thank you thank you <laughs>